Anyhow, welcome to our panel. This is a experiment in humor. Um, we are here to host this man, Mr. Keith Giffen. Yay! Who we realize that this is 40 years we have been going with his sense of humor. Um, and uh, try to think of how we can describe Keith for the people who don't know him. Because, yes, you read his books and you try and, when you read things and watch movies, you try to know people through their writing. And I couldn't think of, you know, said, well, describe him one more. I think of, man's a prick. Uh, you know, anybody who knows him knows that. Um, anybody who's been honored to work with him knows that as well. Um, he has spent many years trying to, uh, how can I say, uh, humiliate me is a nice way. We ha actually have an ongoing uh, situation where we try and see, we can tell each other jokes that would absolutely embarrass the other person. And so far we've been successful in not being able to do that. Um, he uh, has spent many years uh, entertaining you all, and I'll tell you the type of entertainment Keith likes to do to me. And this goes back just as far as two days ago. Oh, what? <laughs> uh, Keith is moving. He's moving into a new house. And I spoke to him at 12 o'clock and said, how's it going? He said, well, you're just about to get ready to unload. So I figured I would call like 6 o'clock and see how it's going to see how my friend is doing. And the phone, I call him and the phone rings and his granddaughter answers the phone. And Megan is whispering into the phone, saying, um, I, I can't talk. Um, Grandpa, while they loading, Grandpa was hit by a car. And we're in the emergency room right now. Um, he's having a CAT scan right now. And uh, um, I, I know it's not like life-threatening or anything like that, but I really, I really can't do Oh, the doctor's coming in. i got to go. And she hands up on me. <laughs> okay, oh, now, whoa, 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 whoa. All I had said to her was, tell him I'm dead. <laughs> to understand the joke of that, yeah. To understand the joke behind that, for those of you who don't know, in 2012, and this is not a joke, 2012, Keith died. Literally, he was declared dead. They, I'm sorry, twice, twice, twice he died. Um, I don't know. We can say fortune or unfortunate. I think it's fortunate, but they're actually able to bring him back from hell. <laughs> uh, for those of you who don't know or may remember the story that Keith wrote called Lobo's Back, who would know that it would actually become his life story written in comics? <laughs> uh, it was very, very autobiographical because heaven didn't want him and hell was afraid of him completely. So they sent him back for us to endure him for a little bit longer. That's a positive thing, I think. Uh, but these are the types of, <laughs> types of jokes that Keith likes to pull. Uh, he likes to make his friends have cardiac arrest on many, many separate occasions. He, is done. he calls me one of the days, and I get a phone call from his wife, and she says, um, Keith died, which freaked me out. She said, don't worry, don't worry, he's, he's alive. And she explains to me the whole story of how he went in for a stress test and died during the stress test, and they brought him back, and now he's having emergency heart surgery. He'll be okay. Now, for those of you who have read Keith's work over the years, there's a little sidebar to this, and I've thought it many times that the man must be on drugs if you read his work. Well, I can tell you that the man does not do drugs, and I can give you an ex exact reason why. While he was recovering, he calls me, and he's in the hospital, and he wanted to fill me in because I was helping with the family with DC. And he takes the phone, we're having a nice normal conversation, he's explaining what happened, and the nurse comes in and has to give him an injection of morphine. And from talking completely normal, he kind of starts slowing down and has to get off the telephone because he has to go put ice on the Christmas tree before it melts. <laughs> <laughs> At which point, he handed the phone to Anna and she said, what did he just say? And he said, he has to put ice on the Christmas tree before it melts. And she said, well, I guess this conversation's over. We'll talk to you later. <laughs> and he was gone. He was in Fruit Loopy Land. But again, for those of us who are honored to know him, those are the types of things that Keith likes to do. Um, he is, we, he, part of the thing with Keith is, uh, how can I say this nicely? We, we share a lot of secrets of things or industry things that are working on. And every time that it comes up in conversation, he says, no, you can't tell anybody about this. 
And then he will go one step further, and I think he's testing me, because he tells me something that's so completely outrageous that it can't be true. And of course it's not. And then we'll talk the next day, and he'll start laughing, you know, in the conversation, and we'll talk about it again, and I'll say, well, what about this? He goes, oh, I just made that up. <laughs> you know, and yeah, that's fun, but as a fan, on the fan side, I guess he's my friend, but on the fan side of it, it's kind of disappointing for this outrageous story that we were just talking about, how this character is going to learn how to fly backwards, you know, when they are normal human. You start, in my head, I just, during the night, I start thinking about these stories, and it's like, but well, where's he going to go with this? And discovered that it was all bullshit. bullshit. That's a technical term that he likes to use. It's bullshit. Um, but that's what this man likes to do to people. He likes to test people's limits in every way possible. When we were, started talking about this roast, I got kind of scared. I didn't want to host it first, um, because I knew that as every roast that's been around, at the end of the roast, the roastee hosts the roasters. And I'll tell you quite honestly, I'm afraid of how this is going to end. <laughs> uh, because it could go pretty, the fact that there's no holds barred, it could go pretty nasty. So, without further ado, I'm going to step down and stop talking, because I do talk too much. And I'm going to introduce Miss Colleen Doran. Oh. Um, you don't want to go first, or go second. Okay, I'll introduce Colleen, we'll go second. Uh, Mr. Paul Levitz will come up here. He's got seniority. He's got seniority. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Paul Levitz. Forty years, huh? Yep. So there was this, uh, how do I put it, emaciated young man who was starting his art career, and he had fooled a couple of editors at Marvel into letting him do a little bit of work, and he was fooling Jerry Conway, who was an editor at DC at the time, and I was Jerry's assistant. Um, and Jerry gave him a couple of, couple of short things to do, I think, at the beginning. And then we were working on All Star featuring the Justice Society. Jerry was writing it. And Rick Estrada had been penciling it for, or laying it out for Wally Wood to finish. And Rick was a wonderfully talented cartoonist and a dear sweet man. Not much of a superhero guy at heart. That just wasn't his thing. Um, what the hell? Give the new kid a chance. He doesn't look like a superhero. A lot of the superhero artists have a tendency at least to look at themselves in the mirror for a moment as they're doing an act. You know, if you want a sense of what Gil Kane looked at, all you have to look at is how he drew people. Hopefully he won't draw people that looks like him, but you know, we have our fingers crossed. So Jerry plots the next All-Star, hands it over to Keith, a couple of weeks go by, the pile of pages come in, in a cloud of nicotine smoke and coffee stains and eau de coffee sort of surrounding it, almost as a combined perfume. This would be a trademark of Keith for many years to come. He knew it was authentically his page because it would come packaged in all of these lovely aromas. <laughs> <laughs> He's a the comics are a wonderful collaborative medium. When they're working really well, they're a game of can you top this? And a really good artist working with a good writer will change things in some fashion and make it better. There's sort of a I don't know what you would call it, a ground rule politically of what the acceptable level of changes are before you ask, or the acceptable level of individual imagination to use. Apparently that's one of the rules that Keith's never read. <laughs> this job comes in. Jerry has the absolutely perfect sense of timing to be abandoning DC for his record-setting, lengthy run of three weeks as Marvel's editor-in-chief. Um, and there I am, the assistant editor. I, I like these characters. Well, can I take this book over? Sure, just finish up this thing that Jerry started. And I'm handed Keith's pages. I've written very little superhero material at that time, probably a half <coughs> dozen Aquaman stories. Yeah. I'm younger than Keith is. We were 
a little more experienced in the field because I started when you can violate every possible child labor law, and I was trying to check them all off one by one. But I'm still a very wet behind the ears puppy. And I'm handed this job using visual storytelling that is completely unlike anything DC has done at that point. And I look at it for a day. I don't know what the fuck to do with it. <laughs> I was so crazed and frustrated that I wrote the dialogue for that issue in one night after work in three hours, I think. This is not a normal pace for dialoguing. I guess it was an 18-pager, probably. Um, and I think I was angry the entire time. Just, how can he do this? It turned out to be one of my better jobs to that point, and some of the pages of it are really quite precious things. But it was, uh, I think, a preview of many years of our working together. Keith likes to tell the story that in our, our later years of working on Legion, when he was assigned to take on the book after I had just come back to it, I was kind of petrified because we had had a challenged period working on All Star together. Some decent stories that came together, but not a perfect emotional fit between us. No. Um, and I was, had been working with Pat Broderick, who was a good, solid artist and didn't fuck with my stories very much. Um, and I had signed on, I felt like I had kind of screwed up Legion the first time I was on it. The second time, I was going to do it right. I was going to take it seriously. And yeah, now Keith's going to be your artist. Yeah? You sure about this? Yeah, yeah, this is going to work fine, Paul. This was Mike Barr, who was then the editor, talking. And Keith's description of that period, which I have no reason to disbelieve from the result, is that he would read my plots on the bus going back to New Jersey, crumple them up, throw them out the window of the bus, and then draw something. Nothing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> technically, I would, I would tear them up and throw them down the sewer grate at the corner. <laughs> a sign of the respect he has always shown his collaborators in the process. I think one of the great virtues of Keith being a writer now instead of an artist is that he's now at the beginning of the food chain, so there's no longer anyone ahead of him for to screw over. But the really good news about that collaboration, the thing that made it delightful, <coughs> is that Keith would draw something that wasn't quite what I had plotted, and he'd have little liner notes explaining what he thought was going on. And then I would write something that had absolutely nothing to do with what his liner notes were. For whatever set of reason, for I guess a period of about three years, we were sufficiently in sync together about who the characters were and what kinds of stories we wanted to tell, that even though neither of us actually saw the individual piece of work the same way, the fundamental thing we were trying to achieve was so close together that one plus one often equaled four or five. I don't know if he ever recognized it when it came out. He may have shuddered as often as I sometimes shuddered looking at the scenes that came in. What is this supposed to be again? Two people and a schnauzer? <laughs> I, I know it's the future, but I'm not quite sure that's going to be legal even then. Um, but it worked. And it unquestionably has been the <coughs> creative success of my career to have that collaboration. It was very clear to me at the time that Keith was a writer, that his boundless imagination could do it. He, I don't think, thought of himself as one at that time. Um, that's what they're paying you for now. Shh, don't tell them. Um, he took some intermediate steps at that time, doing some stories that he would plot and draw. And at that point, he was very much like Sergio Aragonis. And Sergio swore for many years he wasn't a writer, but he would turn in these complete stories, wonderful and perfect. He'd write in little dialogue in the balloons, except it would have a Spanish accent. Um, and someone, either me, Steve Skates, or in later years, Mark Evanier, would translate it into English. It basically meant doing a little bit of cleanup where his Spanish grammar structure didn't work in English. Keith didn't have the linguistic excuse of writing it in another language, but he wrote it in 
Keith, which is in itself another language. And I had the privilege of doing some of the early work on Ambush Bug that way in DC Presents. Um, whatever it says I dialogued or whatever it attributes to me as a writer, it, it's bullshit. Um, you know, those were Keith's stories and I was just doing the translation from the Keith. And I'm not that funny, as is obvious to you guys. Um, and I just, I wrote, I wrote his imagination with, with great fun. It was a tremendous joy to collaborate. Um, it hasn't always worked perfectly. We've had our entertaining moments. But I've never worked with an artist with more imagination, an artist who was a more natural storyteller, or an artist who was capable of giving an editor as massive an ulcer and then having the editor turn around and say, yes, but that was worth it. And that's really a critical difference in this process because there are many, many artists who do wonderful work. You'll hear from some of the ones that Keith has inflicted himself on as a writer. Um, there are many brilliant artists. There are many artists who are complete fucking pains in the ass. Um, very few editors when they're finished with the stuff from an artist who has driven them crazy, say it's worth it. Mostly they say, can you get me somebody who's sane? Nobody ever really said that when they were working with Keith. They were really happy to have him be insane. And when you've got an editor who is as straight and as grounded as Julie Schwartz saying, yeah, give me more of this insanity, that's about the highest testimony you can get in the course of a career. Thank you for your efforts, Mr. Giffen. Uh, I do recall my hair was a different color when we started working together, but you only get partial credit for that. My kids had something to do with it. Um, but a number of these gray hairs do have your name on it. Um, and he's proud of that. Proud of that. That's what we should be. We should own all our deeds and misdeeds. <laughs>
in the Legion of Superheroes, which is only made up of symbols to represent letters. We made Andrew for his birthday, for his 21st birthday, we had made Andrew an application to join the Legion of Superheroes, written entirely in Interlac. It took us quite a while to put it together. And we give it to him, and Andrew picks it up and literally reads it as, Dear Mr. Shaw, thank you for your recent application to the Legion of Superheroes, blah, 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 blah. As easy as you would be reading the newspaper, which is pretty sad. Anyhow, about three weeks after this happens, there was a convention in New York City, one of Fred Greenberg's conventions, and Keith is as a guest at the show. I had never met the man before, and I bring, Keith up, I bring Andrew up to meet Keith, and Keith is just being Keith to the various people that are there, and I introduced my friend Andrew, and I said, Mr. Giffen, this man has a very unique talent. I said, he can read interlock fluently. And Keith kind of cocked his head to the size, and said, what do you mean? And I told him the story of how he made this application. And this bastion of society says, tell him you should try masturbation, it's a lot more satisfying. <laughs> <laughs> this is to a total stranger. <laughs> this is the type of humor that this man has. Oh, Mark made it. Mm. We got room for one? More? Yes, we got one. We always have room for you, Mark. We have a bucket? We have a bucket. Uh, anyhow, he, uh, has, as I said, has spent many years entertaining uh, it, there were times when uh, I would run up with Keith, I had called Andy Helfer's office at one point, um, and, and I hadn't, Keith and I weren't friends at the time, we just you know, knew through the business. And I called Andy Helfer's office, and who I was friendly with, and Andy said, I said, so Keith's here, you want to say hello? And I said, sure, and he picked, and I don't know if I've ever been reminded you of this, Keith answered the phone and says, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even know who's on the other end of the phone. Now he does. Now he knows. Now he looks at his phone and says, oh shit, it's him. <laughs> Puts the phone down. But anyhow, those are just two stories that I thought of, which I wanted to introduce. Anyhow, the next victim who's going to come up here will be Mr. Scott Collins. will come up here and he will tell you of his experiences working with a man that he enjoys working with and yet cringes every time he gets a script, I'm sure. So without further ado, Mr. Scott Collins. Scott Collins and I make comics. I work with many greats in the industry. Uh, Paul Levitz I've worked with, Jan Mattis I've worked with, uh, Robert Kirkman and Jeff Johns. And now Keith Giffen. Uh, Keith and I have done lots of books together and we have a great working relationship. We are currently very excited and uh, working hard on the Rebirth Blue Beetle comic book. It's our well-oiled, stinky, rust bucket of joy. <laughs> See, Keith writes about 30 or sometimes 24 or sometimes 19 pages of a story, uh, that then I have to turn into a 20-page story of art. Uh, we do the best we can uh, looking for readers uh, to hopefully enjoy our books. Uh, we don't know that that's really happened yet, but we're still trying. Uh, but really, working with Keith is pretty easy. I just look for at least a couple panels of action. Just a couple. Uh, I prepare for lots of crabby talking head pages, spewing nonsense. <laughs> and try desperately to keep the body count down. I mean, how many characters have you killed, Keith? He's legendary in our business for fandom knowing it, and as well as the people working with him know this. Um, if, Ke if Keith hasn't had his meds or his cup of coffee in the morning, he's ready to off any childhood fan favorite. <laughs> Other than that, working with Keith is real easy. I just had to learn the Giffen code. I call it the Giffilter. Uh, for instance, when Keith writes five years later, which happens quite a bit, by the way, I just keep ignoring it and keep drawing it. <laughs> but when Jamie, the new teenage blue beetle, complains about his aching hip, I translate to, uh oh, I have a test today. It works great, you just have to run everything through the Gefilte translator. <laughs> that idiot means my editor. <laughs> Don't quit your day job means nice page. But it hasn't always been so easy. I met Keith years ago uh, at a New York comic book convention, not a Comic Con, this was before that, way back when I was a young student at the Kubert School. Keith was a hero of mine, and I was really excited to meet him. And I got my stuff together, I showed him my latest and best samples, um, and he told me to go home. <laughs> yep, it's true, at first my feelings were hurt and I was kind of mad, but then I heard him tell someone else to go home. 
and then another person to go home. <clears throat> That's when I realized he was telling everyone just to go home. <laughs> it wasn't personal, it was just a different language. You just have to translate it. Don't quit your day job again could also mean someday we'll make great comics together and we'll be the best of friends. <laughs> it's actually that easy. And I think that's all I've got. So if some of you have noticed, there seems to be a theme here, which goes back to my original statement. The man's a prick. <laughs> he, he seems to enjoy invoking stress. He has gray hair. He wants to make sure that everybody else has gray hair. He had a heart attack. Right? And I think it's his, he's made it his law of figuring, if you're going to do it to me, you're going to do it to everybody else too. And he's made it an accomplishment in and of itself to um, see what's a common phrase when we're on the phone. Oh shit, the phone's ringing. It's my fucking editor. I'll call you back. <laughs> now, most people, when they work with somebody in, a, in a, a, a reciprocal relationship, they're looking forward to talking to the other person. If this was an isolated incident, you all might be surprised. That's the, how he considers friendly words. Fuck you is a friendly word to him. Because you know if Keith is cursing you out, you know that he likes you. Most people that know him are very honored to call him friend. Um, however, they're also on guard all the time. Because that phone call might be coming on to say, you're fired from the book. Oh, by the way, just kidding. Which, uh, he enjoys doing things like that. He enjoys uh, making people feel uncomfortable. He enjoys making people laugh, which is evidenced by some of his work. And most especially, he enjoys entertaining all of you. But as been said many times, he says, quote, I don't give a fuck what they think. He says, it's my job to get, I get paid, I write the script, and whatever happens afterwards, fuck them. <laughs> you know, as long as he knows that he did a good job in his head, that's all that's important. And he does do a damn good job, that is for sure. And without further ado, the well, next one I'll introduce is his companion, the other half of his mind, Mr. Mark DeMattis. have a, an affinity for the whole roast mentality, you know, so I was talking to Spencer about this, I like to say nice things about people, but then I realized Keith is so attached to his image as a surly malcontent that the best thing, actually the worst thing I could possibly do is say nice things about him, because it would completely screw in his head, so that's what I'm going to do, because all this other stuff, I know that aspect of Keith, to me that's just white noise, and he must not like me as much as he likes Spencer, because he's pretty nice to me, so I don't <laughs> And it's like almost 30 years, so I don't know. Eventually he'll get to like me and he'll say all these awful things to me. So I'll say the nice things that will make him really uncomfortable. One is, this guy is probably, if not the most, one of the single most creative human beings I have ever known in my life. Um, it's the little bit, it's the closest thing I think our generation of creatives uh, have come to working, say, with Jack Kirby, because he's just, when my kids were little, they had these little, bubble bears. I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're made out of plastic. And you squeeze their bellies and their heads pop up. And bubbles come out of the top of their heads. This is what he's like. You squeeze, if you want to come up afterwards, you can come up. <laughs> you squeeze his belly, his head pops up, and ideas come out. And then you wait like 30 seconds, you squeeze again, and more ideas come out. This is the truth. And the story that I always come back to, this is years ago in the 80s, we had a character in our Justice League named Nort, and we were going to do an origin of Nort story. And we were up in Andy's office hanging out, and we're standing in the hall, and he said, I have a great idea for the origin of Nort. And he spends maybe ten minutes detailing this whole story, and I'm listening, and when he was done, I thought, mm, I don't really like that story. I don't think it works for me. Someone else would say, you're an asshole. This is it. And the Keith that they're painting this picture of would say, oh, you stupid asshole, fuck you, and walk away. But what Keith did, he took a breath, and maybe five more seconds passed, and on the spot, he made up another origin of Nord, which was absolutely perfect. And this is what this guy is like. It's just like, squeeze his belly, out come more bubbles. The other thing that he'll hate me uh, to say is that he's the, probably the single most generous collaborator I've ever had. Um, the way we work is not, you know, you see co-writers. So you think it's two guys in a room working together and we're bouncing. It doesn't work like that at all. Keith writes a plot. We may talk about it, but even if we talk about it, he's going to go write something that has absolutely nothing to do with 
with what we've discussed, and then I get to do the dialogue, and I ignore what he did, and that's what makes great comics, is we completely ignore each other. <laughs> a lot of guys, if you give me your plot, and then you say, I'm going to add like three different subplots and change this a little bit and change that a little bit, would say, please fire this guy, and I'll work with him again. Keith loves it, and then he just takes what I do, and then he builds on that, and then he bounces it back to me, and then I bounce it back to him, and somehow, 30 years later, we're still doing it, and it's because of his generosity of spirit. There's no ego involved in our collaboration, and that's a, a rare thing in any kind of creative field. Keith is also incredibly generous in terms of other freelancers. Um, I've seen it many, many times, and I've seen it in terms of myself, too. When, when you're a freelancer, the waves come and the waves go. You work in a Marvel one day and then one day an editor of Marvel wakes up and goes, we don't, want to, we don't want to use him anymore. And then you go back to DC or you go to some other company. We don't want them to go back and forth. That's what you do as a freelancer. I've seen Keith so many times pick up the phone and call whoever the editor is and say, you know, why aren't you using such and such or so and so? Why don't you get them back working there again? He does it all the time. So he's incredibly generous as a creator as a human being, and I hope I've suitably humiliated you <laughs> and made you terribly angry, and now at least you like me enough to tell me to go fuck myself. <laughs> <laughs> tell the Cliff story. Which story was that? <laughs> yeah. We've been talking about this for a Oh, that's right. That was, was it your that was your description, or was it my description? Yeah, was, you were the one. See, we don't, you we also, also yeah, even in one of the things about our collaborative, we have no idea who came up with what. Like, wahaha is this thing we're identified with. He swears I came up with it. I swear he came up with it. We have so I guess it is kind of a mind meld in there. Um, but we might get into the story. Anyway, so. What's the cliff story? No, it's not a story. <laughs> it's, it's actually a cliff metaphor. The metaphor is that basically, you know, our instincts are sort of diametrically opposed in some ways. So it's like Keith starts running from the edge of the cliff. I grab him by the legs and I slow him down so he doesn't go over the cliff, but then I look up and I realize he's dragged me creatively farther than I would have gone on my own. There goes the cliff metaphor. So, in conclusion, tell me to go fuck myself so I know what you care about. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't care. So he doesn't care. I did actually, apropos of what Mark just said, I wanted to bring up one point also, which Keith might be humiliated to know that the public knows as well. He is a man who says, for coming here today, and I quote, I have to make sure I get this work done because I don't want any of my pencilers or any of my talent not having work when I'm not here. Except Scott. Except Scott. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I would refer to as collaborator. Somebody who wants to make sure that you're not waiting for him. Because God knows he makes us wait for everything else. <laughs> Anyhow, we're going to have to make this a little bit faster than we thought, so next, without further ado, Mr. Tom Baerbaum, um, who spent a lot of time working on the region also. It's almost like deja vu up here to hear the other collaborators talk about working with Keith because you hear exactly the experience that we had. But as, uh, as Spencer mentioned, we worked with him primarily on the Legion, a few other projects, and those of you who've worked on the Legion, who are Legion fans, know that Legion fans are, shall I say, rather passionate. <laughs> and over the years, they have had uh, what I would call a love-hate relationship with Keith. And you think you know what a love-hate relationship is with Keith, it's that they loved him in the 80s and they've hated him ever since. <laughs> uh, and in our case, we worked with him on probably the most daring version of the Legion he ever did. And a lot of the old guard Legion fans did not like it. And to those fans, for some reason they thought, writers write, artists draw. So let's see, who's the writers? Tom and Mary Durbaum. They're the evil ones behind this. And, you know, you tend to think, Keith can make the fans so angry that they can't see straight, which isn't literally true. But they can't read a credits box. That they can't do, because right there in the credits box it said, plot by Keith Giffen, but Tom and Mary were the villains. So, uh, but it was worth it. We had a lot of fun. We enjoyed working with Keith. We enjoyed sharing lots of things, including being villainized by many of those fans. But um, the one thing that I thought I would do, uh, there's a TV show where they do mean tweets, where they make the creators come on and read mean tweets about themselves. Well, I'm not going to do that to Keith. I'm not going to make him read the mean tweets. 
I will do that for you. <laughs> yes. Now let me say that I didn't do any thorough research. I was, uh, one night I put on Facebook that they're going to do this event for Keith, and if anyone can make it, that would be great. And as I'm shutting down the computer and going to bed, I'm thinking, you know, I should collect mean things people say about Keith, and I'm thinking, I'm not real great on the internet. Where am I going to find these mean, you know, statements? And I go to sleep, I get up in the morning, I open up my computer, and the first comment to my saying, I'm going to do an event for Keith Giffen, is, okay, I'm curious. When exactly did Giffen start hating the Legion, and why? <laughs> <laughs> to which, within minutes, the first response was, I always figured Giffen hated everything in general. <laughs> <laughs> And within a few hours, the thread featured such thoughtful, insightful commentary as, the older he gets, the more insane his ideas are. And why is it that when a writer says he loves certain characters, he ruins them forever? <laughs> and he hates Karate Kid, thinks Super Karate is the stupidest power ever. Now that one is true. <laughs> And my personal favorite, for its subtlety and restraint, Giffen killed the Legion. Reading his stories made me want to commit suicide. <laughs> <laughs> now, mind you, I went to bed wishing that I could somehow find a few ne negative comments about Keith. And it was as if Barbara Eden went. <laughs> <laughs> But that said, it has been an honor to work with Keith. Uh, he's a brilliant collaborator. I second everything the, his other collaborators have said, and I've never learned more in my life from anyone. Thank you. The next person who's going to come up here is someone who has called Keith friend, collaborator, uh, 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 confidant, among many things, and to me, one of the nicest most beautiful human beings this industry has to offer is Colleen Dorn. I have to say that I got dressed up. Um, I didn't write anything down because I'm not getting paid Baker, and uh, I don't believe in working for free. So um, that is one crazy ass motherfucker. <laughs> and I love him for it. I wouldn't have a career today, I think, without Keith Giffen. He called me up on the phone when I was 17 years old, saw my work in a Legion of Superheroes fanzine, and said, would you like to try auditioning to work on the Legion? I still think he, um, he, he asked me in part because he knew how irritated it would be to hire somebody with a vagina. But um, <laughs> and he's been irritating people by uh, asking to work with me ever since. But um, Keith, Keith is genuinely crazy, but in a, in a crazy, crazy way that I really love. He calls me his crazy little sister. We get on just great. Uh, we, we have similar traumatic backgrounds. Keith used to work in a lab where he killed rats. And uh, I was raised by... And monkeys and squirrels and yeah, I mean this is not a joke. He really did this for a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, my father uh, uh, is a, a policeman, and when I was a kid, he raised me on um, learning about forensic science. So he would show slides of autopsies on the kitchen wall. We get along great. Um, <laughs> belong to something we call Keith Club, and Keith Club is you don't talk about Keith Club, even though that's exactly what we're doing right now, and it's all the really horrible things Keith has said that if they ended up on the Mary Sue, none of us would have a career today. Um, so we, at dinner last night, we were all sitting around talking about it, and Keith said this, and wah -ha -ha, and Keith said that, and wah -ha -ha, but we can't say that on the at the roast because none of us will ever work again. And it was interspersed between horrible stories about Alex Toth beating people up, throwing exacto knives at them, and dangling out the window. The big difference between Keith and Alex Toth is Keith has no malice. He's a He's an equal opportunity offender. He just says things because they're funny. Like us believing that Keith had been in a terrible car accident 15 minutes after we were like, oh my god, oh my god, that's horrible. We were all making Captain Christopher Pike jokes. I mean, that's Keith Club. That's how you operate in Keith Club. You just have the most gritty, awful, dark sense of humor. And in Keith's club it works, but other people 
probably wouldn't get it. I totally get it. I love this man with all my heart. He is my crazy big brother. I really don't have anything bad to say about you. I adore you. Thank you for having me along. He doesn't have to come up, so I thought I was going to turn something. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> <laughs> says it all. Since Keith has made it his life's career, since we became friends 20 odd years ago, to try and humiliate me in every way that he possibly could in the love of friendship, I'm going to return the favor. I would like his daughter Mel to come up here and say a few words. No, no, come on. Let's go. It's only fair. Come on. Mel, come on. Sorry. Come on, you can say, tell him you love it. Come on, come on. I love him. She's got her vibe back. <laughs> See, honestly, that was one of the things. Driving that, back. Yeah, it's driving back. It's driving back. It's his turn. Yeah. He's been waiting. Yeah, see, I'll tell you, we'll give Keith his turn in one second. But I'll tell you, honestly, it's one of the things that everybody who was going to be on this panel, I did have some people turn me down. And the reason they turned him down, because they were afraid, because if you know, if you ever watched Eddie Rose from. Did you know, the the Dean Martin roast all the way through? And the roastee always gets the host to ro the roast the roasters at the end of the roast, and we're all petrified what this bastard's going to say about us in a minute. So since Mel won't let me have my revenge, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the master, the man we're all here to listen about, Mr. Keith Giffen. You don't do it alone, <laughs> but uh, especially in this business, and it's actually been uh, my honor, my privilege, to work with people who make me look good when I'm actually not being that good, or manage to fix a plot, uh, enhance a character, who are collaborators. <coughs> um, so. I can turn my back on them, and when I turn back, everything's okay. Uh, good, solid professionals. Unfortunately, they couldn't be here tonight. <laughs> when, <laughs> when Spencer first told me about this, uh, I initially thought that, you know, why? <laughs> why? Um, and I still wonder why. I, I've been lucky. I've, uh, I've done what I wanted to do for years and years and years, and I've worked with people I want to work with for years and years and years. Um, I don't think many people can say that. So, for all of the faults I could point out, I'm just going to say that, you know, it's been great, and I hope I have many more years together. Thank you. Thank you. I think full of shit because he's, he's being humble and I'm not. <laughs> Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our panel uh, and our roast. And since I've never had this chance to say this before publicly, can you fuck you for all the shit you put me through? <laughs> I'm tired of my phone ringing and I'm getting, hearing on the other end of the phone somebody think, you know what this asshole just said to me? <laughs> so, I know tomorrow morning I'm going to get a phone call while he's getting ready for breakfast saying, fuck you. I'll probably start to get a phone call. You know what the asshole Spencer said to me? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you again. And for all of our panelists and Mr. Giffen, let's give a round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>